Well, welcome to all of you to our uh, 18th annual Goal Awards. We're really happy to have you here. We have one surprise to start with. Um, it's an additional Goal Award winner who is not in your program, but it's a person who has been uh, attending the Goal Awards for 17 years and has watched us honor so many heroes. But he's our hero too. And what he's meant to us cannot be put into words. Bishop Fabian Breskowitz, would you please come up? <laughs> Bishop Breskowitz is finally being allowed to retire. Um, and we're pleased for him, but we're very sad for us. He saved Madonna 17 years ago when we were very close to being sold to a system out of state. Madonna Rehab Hospital is a Lincoln facility today because of Bishop Breskowitz. We've enjoyed 17 years of his unfailing support and guidance. His sponsorship has allowed us to grow to national prominence. Bishop Breskowitz, for all you have done for us and all you have been to us, I present you with Madonna's highest honor, a goal award. And this year we have a Champion of Rehabilitation Award. Dr. Bill Thorell is Director of Cerebrovascular Neurosurgery at the Nebraska Medical Center and Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. He literally has saved hundreds, maybe thousands of lives with his exceptional skill as a neurosurgeon. And he understands that healing doesn't stop when a person leaves the hospital. In addition to patient care and teaching, Dr. Thorell was instrumental in the development of the Nebraska Stroke Center, the first nationally certified stroke center in the state of Nebraska. But what makes Dr. Thorell unique is his outstanding concern for the whole patient. He's the kind of guy who makes time to call a patient at home, remembering that one likes weightlifting and another one likes shopping. One night when he was in Lincoln for dinner with um, Dr. Dan Tomes, who is one of Lincoln's neurosurgeons, and I understand they're very good friends, um, at 10 o'clock at night and in the rain, he stopped by Madonna to see one of his patients, make sure they were okay. Um, he understands rehabilitation and the importance of rehabilitation, and he has spread that word throughout the Nebraska Medical Center. What I tell people is, look, I'm an acute care sort of doctor. I'd love to be able to answer all your questions about what's going to happen in the next six weeks and six months, but I don't actually know those answers. And I learned that early on that what I actually know about is how to try and keep people alive until they're discharged from the hospital. And just like all of medicine in the U.S., it's all very subspecialized and it's so complex that no one person can be good at all things. You have to have people who do things specialized and rehabs specialized. He is one of the best doctors I've ever had. He's very straightforward, which is awesome. He's a very smart, intelligent man. He just told me to stay with therapy. He's very personal, very good doctor. Madonna does a very good job of communicating with us about how people are doing. And they do a really good job of taking care of people. And you see the people where you think, this isn't going to work out so well. But the person's a survivor, so we'll do the best we can. You send them to rehab, and then they walk into the clinic, and they're walking, you know, and they're feeding themselves. And they, you know, have a smile, and they give you a hug, and those sorts of things. That's what happens when they go to Madonna from the time they're discharged from our hospital till the time they come back and see us, and when people make that sort of improvement, you're like, look, this is working, this is a good place. It's geared towards, you know, making big progress. I recommend them a heartbeat. I think I have. I know my mom has, my wife has. I mean, saved my life at least twice. <laughs> if you can count both surgeries, more than that, if you count everything else. When those people come back and they're walking and they're talking, and they're never normal, they're never, life is never exactly like it was before. But 
They love being alive. They are happy that they're alive. Their families are ecstatic that they made it. They're back at a job. Those recoveries are so remarkable. Those particular people really drive the way you think. You think, you know, if we can get them to rehab, if we can just get them through this hospitalization, this person looks like they might be able to be that person. If you can get them to rehab, you've got a fighting shot. Dr. Thorell, um, in the past, you know, we've always had a theme. We had our tribute to the military, um, the year that we had about 350 uh, military personnel from Iraq and Afghanistan with, with brain injuries. We had a, the pediatric theme, the year that we expanded the pediatric hospital. Um, and we had, I think last year was the um, technology um, and research advances of Madonna. This year, we're focusing on patients who were patients quite a few years ago, just to show you what a long road back it is. Last year, Madonna admitted patients from 32 states and 74 Nebraska counties. Almost 6,000 patients came to Madonna to be served by over 1,500 employees. That makes Madonna one of the 10 largest employers in the city of Lincoln and one of the largest rehabilitation hospitals in the whole country. We have the most advanced technology in the region. Our research center is developing the therapeutic practices of the future and sharing them with facilities around the country. We received our first patent for one of our inventions, and you saw that last year, the eye care. Since that time, we have licensed it to a firm in Taiwan um, who, is, um, are, are, who are manufacturing it and selling it in 80 countries around the world. So we're really hoping that we get some royalties from that to keep our research going. We have the most highly trained, specialized, and caring staff you will find anywhere. And they have propelled us forward to help, help along the miracles that we see every day at Madonna. Our 2012 Goal Award winners are just four of the thousands who could claim to be our heroes. We've had so many stories that we actually added another award ceremony internal, internally to Madonna, and we had that a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago. Again, some heartwarming and wonderful stories of success. Um, this year, the theme, The Long Road Back, um, we've chosen to honor graduates from years past, and we really want to show you how long it takes, how much motivation, tenacity, and work it takes to really realize those dreams. Rehab professionals don't measure success at discharge. If we have done our job correctly, our graduates know how to keep reaching for the stars to keep improving, and our four Goal Award winners today are proof of that. And if you'll turn your attention to the screens, we'll tell you their stories. Historical figures like Plato, Shakespeare, and Thoreau have all compared the composition and performance of music to the path and process of life. Some lives follow a consistent path, seemingly gliding over the keys of adversity and hardly hitting an off note. But other lives, in the midst of a steady performance, hit an unexpected change. The 2012 Goal Award honorees share a common path. Lives that were on an unwavering course were sidetracked, not knowing if they would ever continue in the direction they were once headed. These four have battled through years of extended, intense rehabilitation, which they say was the only way they were able to return to their passions. 
Most importantly, they took the fork in the road to blaze a new trail, doing amazing things with their lives that they may not have achieved otherwise. Under the most challenging circumstances, they forged ahead to success through rehabilitation. I was going down a road approaching a car that saw me coming and she, by the way, was stopped with her turn signal on. When I was 58 feet from her, she was rear-ended by a SUV and pushed at me and pushed sideways. It was just a few feet away. I could see I wasn't gonna get stopped evidently and I jumped off the motorcycle backwards. The motorcycle went into the car. I slid underneath the car, hit my head, because there was no place else to go evidently, and I hit my head on uh, the frame of the car that was exposed from its rear end collision. I had widespread bleeding and bruising on the brain. Gary Hausman had flown commercial aircraft for more than 30 years and was chief pilot for Warner Enterprises in Omaha at the time of his motorcycle accident in September of 2006. He had a very serious injury. It's very difficult for clinicians to predict the extent of recovery after such a brain injury. I had very guarded outlook for his recovery. I remember coming through Fort Calhoun on my Goldwing motorcycle at 8.05 in the morning, and that is the last thing I remember until about three weeks later recovering at Madonna Hospital in Lincoln. As soon as we got into Madonna, everything just felt, I just felt this big relief roll off my shoulders because it felt right. It just felt like he was gonna get the help that he needed. He had to learn everything all over again. He had to learn how to walk. You know, he couldn't find some of the words that he wanted. And then one of the things that really just was mind boggling to me was when we went into a therapist's office and she was showing him pictures. She was showing him, okay, what is this Gary? And it was an apple and he couldn't tell her what it was. Gary's rehabilitation team focused on helping him rebuild the complex skills needed to return to flying. Madonna did tailor my recovery to the fact that I was gonna get back to flying someday. Now, I don't know as though they really knew I would, but, but they knew that was the idea. But they would, they would talk airplanes to me. They would ask me questions about airplanes, questions about the jets that I fly. That was at the forefront of every meeting that I had with people. We talked about my love of flying and, and uh, they kept my brain stimulated that way. His brain just kept waking up from the consistency of the therapy. Pretty much almost every day I saw a, an improvement in him. Gary's passion for piloting fueled his determination in outpatient therapy. Four years later, Gary passed his class one medical test, equaling the certification level he held prior to the accident. He has resumed his position as chief pilot for Warner with absolutely zero residual side effects from the brain injury. Gary serves on the Nebraska Brain Injury Advisory Council and is an active advocate for motorcycle helmet legislation. First of all, you better have some help from up above. I mean, God comes first. Uh, my wife, family, friends, and that support group is number two. And then number three is the excellent, excellent medical attention that I did just happen to receive. And uh, it was a continuing effort from Madonna um, in my recovery process. I'm just very fortunate, very, very fortunate. One vehicle rollover accident, just a total freak accident. A truck came over the hill and I had to swerve to miss him and I lost control on the gravel and my truck flipped. So I was partially ejected, the truck rolled a couple of times. Um, my left leg had gotten caught up in the steering column and when I ended up stopped rolling, um, I was actually hanging out of the driver's side window by my left leg. At first I kind of went into panic mode and was screaming and then I realized, okay, that there's nobody here to help me and I better just start conserving energy. 
In 2004, Brianna Beckworth swerved to avoid an oncoming car and she rolled off the road, sustaining an incomplete spinal cord injury. When she arrived at Madonna for rehabilitation, Brianna was still unconvinced about the severity of her injury. They started therapy with me right away. Then I met Janelle and I remember the first day on the mat, it took a lot for her, I think, to really give me a wake up call to get me to realize that I really had something wrong with me. And she laid me down on the therapy mat and she said, sit up. And I'm like, okay. So I went to sit up and I couldn't do it. And I, you know, that was like the first realization that I really had something wrong. She's like, all right, you know, we got a lot of work to do. Let's get to it. In addition to her physical rehabilitation, Madonna staff also assisted Brianna with the emotional trauma from the accident. In therapy, I was working with Janelle and she wanted me to practice transferring in and out of their car that they have in the therapy gym. And so we transferred me into the front seat of the car and she helped me swing my legs in and all of a sudden like the world just crashed down on me. <laughs> and she ended up dragging me back out of the car and that's when we finally realized that it was panic attacks. So then basically I was diagnosed by that point with post-traumatic stress and I actually saw a therapist at Madonna for close to two years dealing with, dealing with the after effects of that. They were able to teach me how to work through those things and to actually continue on with my life without making it stop because of it. Because otherwise, you know, you just avoid everything. Eight years of hard work later, Brianna is thriving in life. She married her longtime boyfriend, Steve, last month and has achieved amazing success educationally and professionally since the accident. I actually got my pre-med degree, biology and chemistry through Concordia first and was actually getting ready to take my MCATs and I had sent an application to nursing school just kind of on a whim and I got accepted. And so I called my family and I was pretty excited and I was like, you know, I think I should be a nurse. <laughs> so it sort of happened happenstance, but at the same time, it was really, really a great choice. So I just graduated with my Bachelor of Science in Nursing from UNMC here in Lincoln. Um, I have accepted a job for the Johnson County Hospital, so I'm going to be an RN for them. I have an understanding of patient care from a completely different side and a lot of empathy for a lot of things people are going through just because I've been there. So, you know, that kind of adds something that a lot of new grads I don't think have. Brianna qualified to compete for selection on the U.S. Paralympic equestrian team, striving for the goal of making the World Cup in four years. She has also been honored by the American Red Cross with the Tribute to Heroes Award for her work in training dozens of rescue dogs to be guide and service dogs for those in need. The progress that she had made when uh, you didn't know what she was going to be able to do was amazing. Her willpower, I guess, to keep going and keep pushing on was just phenomenal with the help that she had. My outpatient therapy continued for nearly three years and you know it it was two to three days a week for three years and without that I would not be walking like I am today. Um, I would still be in a wheelchair most of the time. It took me nearly three years to be out of my wheelchair half the time. It's so important to have that access and to be able to continue and do the things you need to do for as long as you need, as long as you're continuing to make progress because it never stops. We uh, had a car problem uh, with our trailer coming back from hunting trip with my brother and my son, my youngest son. And outside of Waco near York, we had some car trouble with the trailer and had to go into Walmart of York to pick up a part, came back, and I do remember, the last thing I remember uh, was plugging in the electrical system and just about ready to get back in the car. And I think four or five days later, I remember waking up in the intensive care unit and I probably didn't use very, very kind language, but I uh, basically was asking, what the heck am I doing here? Two days before Christmas in 2007, Bob White was checking the back of his trailer on the side of Interstate 80 in Nebraska when a drunken driver slammed into him, pinning him between his trailer and the car. After six weeks in the hospital and surgery to amputate his left leg, he still had just one goal in his recovery. I kept asking my wife and all of the nurses, now I've got the Olympic trials in three and a half months. And I do officiate, that's kind of my little hobby, 
um, at a level now, they call it a master official, that uh, I get to referee and, and go around the country and, and officiate different, different levels of track. He had a mission even in the hospital bed of knowing that whatever it entailed, whether he was going to be able to save the leg or not, that this deadline was lurking in the wings and that he was, that was his in intent, was to go to the Olympic trials. Bob's rehabilitation at Madonna started exactly three and a half months before the trials were to begin. In addition to his regular therapies, Bob would circle the hallways at Madonna, aiming to walk an additional 13,000 feet every day on his own. Madonna did great things. They are creative. They had me out running through holes, up and down, on rocks, on gravel, going off and off the curbs. I was outside probably when the weather was, was affordable more than I was actually in the gym. Every time I showed up for my day of rehabilitation, I never asked what we're doing today because I knew they were gonna come up with something brand new because they always put their minds together of what can be creative and what can actually get you through your new lifestyle. Bob made it to officiate the Olympic trials in 2008 and added a third stint as a master official at the prestigious event again this year. He also immediately returned to teaching and coaching track at Lincoln High, a position he has held since 1978. When you tell me you can't get your notebook done or get that assignment done, it does not hold well in Coach White's class. And then I said, now remember, you're with the wrong teacher at the wrong point of time in your high school career because I've got the fake leg. And I, what I've been through, you know what, there is no excuse for not getting that assignment done. And the same with my coaching as a track coach. I, I, don't, I don't hear no. And while he says his recovery is still a work in progress, Bob is grateful for every single therapy session he received and credits rehabilitation for the opportunity to return to his passions. If I would have had a limited number of, of times, even you know, 25% less of what I did have, I don't think that I'd, that I'd be where I am today. Everything that I'm able to do today, I'm using their rehabilitation principles and everything that they taught me. He was two years old and he was visiting family and um, was on a cousin's shoulders and fell off and hit his head on the, on the kitchen floor and sustained a, a brain injury. He had a, a blood clot the size of a quarter pound hamburger on the left side of his brain. So he almost, they said in 10 minutes, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have lived. Bretton Cole's brain injury in 2002 left him with an uncertain future just two years into his life. When he first came to Madonna, he really couldn't do much of anything. They had a children's wheelchair for him, um, but he really couldn't do anything. He was not able to move his right, right side at all for, at that point and was speaking a couple of words and that was it when he came here. Breton's inpatient stay at Madonna lasted three weeks. His outpatient recovery through rehabilitation extended through the next seven years. It was years of therapy that benefited him, got, got him to where he is. You know, he really needed, he really needed all of that and the muscles and the strength and he just, he needed that extra time. It, it, it wasn't until he was almost released where he was able to ride a bike and he was nine years old. You know, most kids start riding a bike at four. So even with all that therapy, it still took a long time for him to get some of those skills. Rehabilitation changed my life because I wouldn't be at this point right now maybe still in that wheelchair and I don't know how I could do as much as I can right now if I were in that wheelchair. When we came here I just had hope that he would be like a normal kid like every other kid and be able to play and run and go to school. It was nice because everybody seemed like they were really cared about his outcome and, and his his life and getting him to be as normal as possible. Ten years later, Breton is an outstanding student and an accomplished musician who has adapted the various instruments and music he plays to work within his limitations. I like to write music. I play the piano. I'm learning the guitar. I play the trumpet, the French horn, and oh yeah, I sing. That one. <laughs> I think that creativity comes to me really easily. 
we're always proud of him because he he has such a positive attitude and he's such a great kid who loves everyone. I never doubted for a minute that he was going to be exactly who he was supposed to be. When they said they didn't know if he would make it, that wasn't, that wasn't an option. I just always felt like God had a great plan for him and, and he wasn't put on earth to be here for such a brief amount of time. He was gonna be something great and he came through it and he's impacting people through his experience and through his optimism and it doesn't make sense all the time but it's, it always, it will turn out the way it's supposed to turn out. Four life-changing events. Four people dedicated to recovery. Four amazing lives now being lived to their fullest. The 2012 Goal Award honorees are not only shining examples of the triumph of the human spirit, but also illustrations of the powerful lifelong impact of quality rehabilitation. These are injuries where the recovery isn't overnight, it's sometimes not even over a course of months. Our goal is to really get them functioning as much as they can and to the best ability that they can and really educating the patient and the family and having that long-term perspective with a rehabilitative plan. Gary, Brianna, Bob, and Breton have risen above challenges that most people would have considered impossible to overcome. Like the musician who briefly stumbles midway through a brilliant performance, these four have recovered, pushed on, and finished strong. All four are now living lives worthy of a standing ovation. Gary? Where are you, Gary? Well, just when you thought this couldn't get any, any better, it's my pleasure to introduce a young man who can power light bulbs just by walking by. Josh Sundquist is the author of the national bestseller, Just Don't Fall, and he has been featured on CNN, USA Today, and NPR. He's appeared on television to present an award to Lance Armstrong and was featured on the back of, Dor of a Doritos bag around the world as the founder of LessThan4.org, the world's largest online community for amputees. He has spoken to hundreds of thousands of people across the globe, including audiences at Fortune 500 companies, inner city public schools, and the White House. His hobbies include par three golfing, whatever that is, tying bow ties and combing his hair. He gave us those. <laughs> he has a great sense of humor. If you haven't uh, looked at it yet, check out his rap on um, YouTube. It's, it's just a riot. Um, please welcome, um, give him the warm Nebraska welcome to Josh Sundquist. So as you can probably imagine, as a result of having one leg, I get asked a lot of like really uh, stupid questions. So I was once talking to this girl about my prosthesis, which I was wearing at the time, right, about how it works and what it's made out of and that sort of thing. And she looks down at it and she's like, is the foot fake too? I was like, you know, it's amazing medical technology they have these days. I actually took my real foot and attached it. But yeah, you would not believe, I mean, like last summer I was walking around my neighborhood in Washington, D.C., no prosthesis like this, walking on my crutches. This guy comes, he, he taps me on the shoulder, and I turn around, and he's like, hey, how come you don't have a prostate? Excuse me? Do you have x-ray vision? 
But probably one of my most favorite questions was uh, about a year ago, I was out on a date. It was like my third date with a girl who's now my girlfriend. And there was a guy sitting at a table nearby us who started asking about, you know, why I was on the crutches and, and that sort of thing. And I was explaining how I'd lost my leg. And he asked me in like total seriousness, he's like, so, uh, you know, like how, how long is it going to take for your leg to grow back? Like, what, do I look like a starfish to you? I can't regrow appendages. I mean, you guys are doing some amazing stuff at Madonna, but I don't think we're quite at that level yet. Maybe a few more grants from Larry the Cable Guy, and we'll regrow some limbs, but at this point, it's not going to happen. But long before I, I lost my leg, I was a normal kid with two legs and two arms who loved to play soccer. That was like my favorite thing in life. And I remember I had this life-changing moment for me when I saw this other kid that I knew named Aaron. And Aaron was wearing this lime green travel soccer team uniform. And I remember I looked at that thing and I was just like, oh, that is so cool. I have got to get one of those. And I was just like so excited about it. And so my parents let me, like they told me, like I was finally, it took me several weeks to convince them to let me try out. And finally my mom showed me the day on the calendar when the tryouts were going to take place. And so I went in the backyard and I was practicing every day for these soccer tryouts, right? And you know how it is when, when you're young and, and you're looking forward to that certain day, whether it's your birthday or Christmas or travel soccer team tryouts, right? It just seems like time moves so slowly, Right? Now, I'm relatively young, I'm 28, but I'm old enough to know that as we get older, the days and the months and the years, they go by faster and faster, don't they? But like I said, when you're young, man, it just seems like that day is never going to come. But the interesting thing for me at age nine was that it never did. Because literally the same week, that I was going to try out for that first travel soccer team, I instead woke up from a biopsy. And I'm sure many of you have been under anesthesia at some point in your life, but you know, there's doctors and nurses running around, and you're sort of groggy. And I remember waking up, and, and my parents walking into the room, and my dad came, he stood on the left side of my bed, and he looked down at me, his, his nine-year-old son, and he said, Joshua, Joshua, the, uh, the doctors found cancer in your leg. They told me that I had a 50% chance to live. I started chemotherapy. I lost my hair, which was a big deal for me because at that point in my life, you know, like I like to, I, I to style my hair like I would comb it all like straight back. I'd use like half a bottle of gel every morning. And mind you, not just any gel. This was LA Looks Level 5, most extreme hold, the red kind with all of the bubbles in it. Yeah. So for me at that age, it was like especially devastating uh, to find out that I was going to be losing my hair. But you know something cool? I had a great support system around me. 18 of my friends came over to my house. We had a head shaving party. And they all shaved their heads so that I wouldn't be the only one without hair. Not too long after, I, uh, I did end up losing my leg because of the chemotherapy. I was on for several months. It didn't get rid of uh, the, the tumor. And soon after that, I was fitted with an artificial leg. And I remember one day I was in the hospital where I was treated at the University of Virginia Children's Hospital in Charlottesville, Virginia. And this is a teaching hospital. And I know some of you are here from different hospitals. And if you are from a teaching hospital, you'll know what I mean when I say that this was a medical student. And medical students, they are very, like, they just, you know, they know everything, and they're just very excited to demonstrate this world of knowledge that they have. And so this guy, he was like, you know, I, doing the normal, like, routine, like, eyes, ears, mouth, nose. And the time comes for him to take a pulse. And he, he puts his, like, two fingers down on me. He's counting out the seconds on his watch. 
And he starts to look just like freaked out. And finally, my mom leans over to him in just this kind motherly voice. And she's like, um, Joshua now has what we call a prosthesis. <laughs> and you are trying to take a pulse from it. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the only way he could have looked more foolish in that moment would be if he was like, oh, well, uh, is the foot fake too? <laughs> and how long is it going to take to grow back also? I've not learned that yet in medical school. But I was very eager after I lost my leg then to return to playing sports in whatever way that I could. And so I went about 30 days after I lost my leg to play in my church's annual summer softball game. And I remember when it was my turn to go up to bat. I set my crutches down and I hopped over to home plate. And you have to know that at this point I was, of course, still on chemotherapy. I didn't have hair. I had a toboggan, or not a toboggan, a, uh, like a baseball cap. You know, I didn't have eyebrows. I was very sick. I was pale. I was thin. And I hadn't really learned how to balance yet, and so I had to lean on the bat as if it were a cane until Pastor Smulin threw this big underhanded pitch towards me. And I waited and I watched until that ball was right in front of me, and then I had all in one motion. I, I picked up the bat and I swung, and I missed. And the force of the swing spun me around, the bat went falling, or went flying rather, and I fell down in that, you know, that sort of dry, dusty dirt that you find in baseball infields. And I, I stood up, I brushed myself off, I picked up the bat, I hopped back over to home plate. Another, another pitch, I got another strike. Now, some of you here are goal award recipients, some of you are former patients, and, and so you'll know what I mean when I say that, like, in that moment it was so important I just, I had to prove, you know, that I could still do things even though I had one leg. I had to prove it to myself. I had to prove it to all my friends from church who were there. And I had to prove it to my dad who was watching from behind the fence. And in fact, in that moment, my dad, he yelled out a piece of advice for me. Now, I'm sure many of you have children. Uh, if if you have a child, what's, what's the advice you always give your child when he or she goes up to bat? Exactly. Keep your eye on the ball. So my dad yelled out at me. So I was like, all right. So in that third pitch, <laughs> yeah, it's such a panacea. Just keep your eye on the ball. It's, that's, it's very simple. <laughs> so on that third pitch, as the ball was coming towards me, I kept my eye on that ball until it got right in front of me. And I swung, and I missed. And the bat went flying, and I fell down in the dirt. And so I picked up my crutches, and I started to walk off of the infield. And I heard Pastor Smulin from the pitcher's mound. He said, where are you going? And I said, well, I, I struck out. And Pastor Smulin, he said, we're Protestants, brother. We play by grace, not by the law. <laughs> I was nine years old. I was like, what, Prada what? What are you talking about? I don't understand. But somehow I surmised that that meant I was allowed to get up and keep swinging. And so I did. I took another swing and another and another. And after nine strikes, I started to see the bottom half of my vision become blurry. And like all my friends were there. A lot of the guys who had shaved their heads for me were there. And I couldn't let them see me cry. So again, I picked up my crutches and I started to walk off the field. And at this point, my dad, my dad yelled at me. And I wonder for those of you who have kids, you know, in that moment, like, what would you yell at your child? Right? You, you want to teach them a lesson, like, not to give up, but you don't know. I mean, 
how many strikes it's going to take. You, you have no idea, but, but you want them to know you've got to keep going. You've got to stay in that game. Don't walk away. Don't give up. My dad, he yelled at me. He said, Joshua, you almost had that last one. And I stopped. And I looked at him over my shoulder. And my dad, he, he put his two fingers through the holes in the chain link fence. And he said, it was this close. And I looked at my dad. My dad, and he was my hero. And I knew that if he was up to bat, he would keep swinging until he got a hit. So I walked back over to home plate, got another strike, another and another. Finally, on the 13th pitch, I felt the ball bounce off the bat. And by the time it had rolled up the infield, and into the glove of the shortstop, my friend Tim, who was my designated runner, was already on first base. I share that story with you for two reasons. Number one, because I think that that, that really is the story of rehab. Because you don't get better on the first swing, or the second swing, or the third swing. Rehab takes a long-term commitment. That's the attitude that you have to bring to your recovery, and that's the atmosphere that Madonna provides for its patients. And the second reason I tell you that story is because, you know, that game was a lot like life, because in life, unlike normal baseball or softball, you get as many strikes as you want. Or you only strike out when you quit. And I think the people who do great things in life are the ones who step up to home plate and they say as many strikes as it takes. I'm going to knock it out of the park. So I was still, like I said, on chemotherapy at that point. And I had this really cool opportunity not long after. See, I did my rehab at a, uh, a children's rehab hospital called Kluge uh, that's connected with UVA in Charlottesville. And Kluge was taking a group of kids up from the rehab center to the local ski resort to learn how to ski. And so I went up there and I, I, I got these, uh, what well, they're called outriggers. They look like forearm crutches with ski tips on the end. And I learned how to ski and I realized on that first day that I could ski faster on one leg than a whole bunch of people on the bunny slope could ski with two legs. And I was immediately in love with this sport. And so I skied once more, and then finally a third time that season, while I was still on treatment, I got to compete in a recreational level race at the mountain. And I'll never forget, I went through the course, and I wasn't very good. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I went through the finish line. I sort of skidded to a stop. And you have to remember that at this point, I, you know, I, I was still reeling from the psychological impact of the amputation, from the fact that I was never going to be a great soccer player. I was never going to wear that, that lime green uniform, right? And this guy I had never seen before, he walked over to me. He put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, son, I used to coach something called the United States Paralympic Ski Team. And I think that you have great potential. And I looked up from the snow to his pants, and his pants were red and white and blue. And then I looked up from there, and the jacket matched the pants. <laughs> I was like, sign me up for these Paralympics. <laughs> have your people get in touch with my people. <laughs> and you know, when I look back, man, that day, that moment, that coach changed the course of my life. Because that coach, and by association, my rehab hospital who took me there to learn how to ski, they gave me an opportunity, an opportunity that I never otherwise would have even known existed. 
And that's exactly what Madonna does. Each and every day gives its patients opportunities that otherwise they might not even have known existed. Well, time went by. I didn't start ski racing in a serious way until I was a little bit older. But I finished the chemotherapy. My hair grew back. Three years later, I was declared cured of the cancer. Three years after that, I was 16. That's a big year for me. That was when I started racing, and it was also in my family. We weren't allowed to date until we were 16. And so that was my, my, the year that I, I finally could like, go out on a date. And I remember one of my first dates, I went on this date. And I don't, um, I, like, to protect her privacy, I used to use her real name, but now like, there's Facebook, and people would start looking her up on Facebook after my speeches. Um, so I don't do that anymore. So give me, what's, what's a hypothetical first name of an attractive 16-year-old girl? Heidi. Heidi. Perfect. Thank you. Is, that, is there a Heidi you know or anything? Oh, okay. It's purely hypothetical. Okay, just want to make sure. So I was on this date with Heidi. How about a, what a last name? Anderson. I like Heidi Anderson. That sounds really very hot. Okay, so I was, on, I was on this date with Heidi Anderson. Woo! So hot, right? And I took her out to play golf. Now, specifically, I was playing par three golf. Marsha, you were saying you didn't know what par three golf is. It's like extended putt-putt, basically. It's like a cross between mini golf and real golf. And we have this free par three golf course where I grew up in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And so I hit this brilliant shot off the sixth T on the course, like soars through the air, comes down, stops like two or three feet away from the hole. And I'm like, oh man, the shot is so good. Heidi Anderson, she's totally going to want to make out with me now. It's going to be great. And I'm all excited, right? I'm like, yes, yes. Right? And where's Bob? Bob, where are you? Bob. So Bob, you know this, right? Artificial legs, I was wearing my artificial leg at the time. Artificial legs come pre-programmed to malfunction at the worst possible moments <laughs> in your life. So let me give you a little slow motion demonstration of what happened, all right? I was like, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, right? And so I fall down on the ground, okay, and it's very awkward, all right, because no one ever knows, like, what do you do when the guy with one leg falls down? <laughs> like, are you allowed to laugh at him? <laughs> Should you take him to therapy or something? <laughs> like, nobody knows. And so I'm trying to remedy this situation, so here's what I do. I walk over to the edge of the fairway, like literally one foot is facing this way, other foot is like this, so I'm walking over, and I take my artificial leg and I start kicking it against a tree <laughs> to try to pop the foot back into place. So I'm just like kicking this tree, At this point, you can imagine the other golfers are looking at me like, yeah, 911. <laughs> Got a guy here. Well, first of all, his foot is broken backwards. <laughs> Secondly, he seems to have some serious anger management issues. <laughs> but I'll never forget this one moment right after I, I stood up and I saw my foot was turned around backwards and I was sitting there singing. I was like, oh, man, this is my first date with Heidi Anderson. She is so hot, and now it is ruined. But then I thought, you know, this is my first date with Heidi Anderson, and you only get one first date, so why would I let it be ruined? So what did I do? I got back up. I laughed about it. I tried to get the foot popped back into place. And I took my first step towards the putting green. And the reason that's important is because you and I, we fall down every single day. Sometimes figuratively in small ways, 
sometimes literally in major ways, and then we need rehab. But in either case, we have a choice. We can sit there, we can complain about it, we can feel sorry for ourselves, or we can get back up and we can take that first step on our journey to recovery. It's a journey with thousands of steps, but the most important is the first, is that moment when you decide to start walking towards that recovery. But make no mistake, you know, the journey to recovery is a difficult one. It is a frightening one. I remember, you know, the, uh, the, the, the day that I was going to lose my leg, checking into the hospital with my mom and my dad. I had been on uh, chemotherapy for about three months. I had been on crutches for about three months because I had, you know, this tumor in my femur. I wasn't supposed to walk on it because my leg was so fragile. And I remember I set my crutches down on the tile linoleum floor there in the hospital in this waiting room. And I sat down in between my mom and my dad. And I remember I, I bent over and I wrapped my arms around my left leg. And I just remember, I just remember it was so quiet in that room. Finally, a doctor and a nurse came in, and the nurse, she was pushing an empty wheelchair. And the doctor, he looked down at me, he said, we're, uh, we're ready to take you back now. And I remember I looked at that wheelchair, and I looked at him, and I said, I think that I am going to walk. And I'll never forget taking that first step down that, that corridor in the hospital hallway. If you've spent much time in a hospital setting, you know you wear usually those sort of brown terry cloth socks. And they have sort of rubber strips on the bottom. I remember I could feel that, that cool linoleum floor underneath those brown terry cloth socks. And I, I knew that those would be the last steps that I would take you know, with two legs. You know, we all, we all have times in our life when, when things are falling apart in big and small ways. And it's, it's a strange thing for me, you know, because like this is my job. I, I give speeches, I travel around, and I have the opportunity to share my story with all sorts of different groups. And you know, and I'm, I'm like anyone else, right? I have the times in my life when, when everything is like falling apart. And in those times, it's like, like how, I feel like, how can I get in front of other people and try to like share hope with them when inside I feel like my life is, is crashing down? And I'm sure you've had that feeling, you know, when you feel like you have to put on a mask or something. But in those moments... You know, I think the best, the best that we can hope for is the courage to stand and the strength to walk. I had another nine months of treatment after my amputation. So in total, I was on chemo for a year. I spent about 100 nights in the hospital. But at the end of that year is when I met that coach who told me about the Paralympics I finished the treatment, my hair grew back. Like I said, three years later, I was declared cured of the cancer. And three years after that, when I was 16, I went on that day with Heidi Anderson, and I started ski racing for the first time. And I was not a naturally talented ski racer. In my first race, I fell five times. Like, I wasn't very good. But I was very dedicated, and I had this motto that I wrote on the tip of my skis. My motto was 1MT, 1MT, which stands for one more thing one more time. And that's the motto that I used every day to motivate myself as a ski racer. And you know, seeing today's Goal Awards recipients, seeing those videos, I thought to myself that there could be no better motto that could represent the grit and determination that it took for them to recover, to regain their independence in life. But for me, that motto motivated me to keep training and racing for the next six years. 
And to make a very long story very short, in March of 2006, I had the incredible honor to walk into the Olympic Stadium in front of 30,000 people, including my mom and my dad, for the opening ceremonies of the Paralympics. And I was wearing a uniform, not the lime green soccer uniform that I thought I wanted when I was a kid, but one, it turns out, was even better. It was red and white and blue. And it said, U-S-A. I learned a couple things that day, and the first one is this. That sometimes, sometimes, the uniform that we get in life is better than the one we thought we wanted. And the other thing I learned that day was this, that you know, walking into that stadium that day, that was definitely the most beautiful walk of my entire life. But you know, I didn't start ski racing until after I lost my leg, right? Because I couldn't play soccer anymore. Which means that, if you think about it, the most beautiful walk of my life only happened because of the toughest walk of my life. Twelve years before, on that hospital tile linoleum floor. And that's why I think that life, no matter how tough it is, and make no mistake that life is tough. The fact that we woke up today for another day means that life is beautiful. I want to finish up here in just a second with one concluding thought. Before I do, I want to let you know I have a, a free gift I'd love to give any of you who are interested in. Um, this is a, uh, a couple years ago I did this sort of like bodybuilding transformation and these pictures have become like extremely popular on the internet recently. Um, so if, if you would like to pick this up as sort of a, a you know, remembrance of today and the inspiration that you felt, um, it has my contact information on the back. Uh, these are free and I'd love to give you one. They'll be on a table out there in the lobby on your way out. But here's what I wanted to finish up with, with this question kind of for you. Have you ever, have you ever thought, you know, if, if you could go back in time, five years, ten years, twenty years, whatever, to yourself, knowing the things that you know now, what advice would you give your former self? And the reason I ask you that is because, for me, I've often thought, if I could go back to that nine-year-old boy, as he walked down that hallway to his amputation, if I could walk alongside him, I would say, you know, look, I know right now it just seems like your, your life is over and, and you can't play soccer anymore and you're going to have one leg and, and, and it just seems like there's no hope left. But listen to me, you can't even imagine, you, you literally can't imagine how well things are going to turn out. Just, just trust me on this. Look, look, no matter what happens, just remember to keep hope alive. And those are the three words that I would like to leave you with this morning. Is to keep hope alive. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So think about a couple of those things. Courage to stand and strength to walk. One more thing, one more time. So it's perfect for our group. And uh, Josh, thank you again for, for your message. Uh, Josh will be in back uh, with his gift as well as a, a great book that he has that he'd love to sign for you. So uh, take a minute and, and stop and say hello uh, in the atrium. Uh, a couple other things. Before you leave, I want to bring to your attention the postcard in your program. So you had a little, little postcard. It says February 2nd, 2013. Uh, you know, Goal Awards Luncheon is not a fundraiser. It's a thank you. And it's a way that we can, we can share together our thoughts. Uh, we can close our eyes and think about what we've seen. And we can reopen them for ourselves and our families <clears throat> and other patients that need us to share this idea and this, this wonderful place of Madonna with them. So please be an ambassador and do so, and make sure that you put this date on your calendar 
uh, because we do have a new uh, annual fundraising event that the foundation is sponsoring. And we'll have more details to come, uh, but it'll be at the Rococo Theater, and uh, we're looking forward to that. So thanks so much for being here, for everything you do for Madonna. Uh, share the word, spread the word, 